calf roping. We know it today is a sport, but it had its beginning on the open range of the southwestern territory of these United States of America. Now, in the early days of cattle raising, the only corrals were at the headquarters, and most of the time miles away from where the cattle would be grazing. And because of the vastness of the open range, herdsmen were needed to watch over the animals, making sure they were well taken care of. And since the majority of the early herdsmen were very young, and the job was primarily watching cows, well, they became known as cowboys. Oftentimes, these young cowboys would go out on the range for weeks, months at a time, when they would find a sick or injured calf needing some medical attention. It was impractical to take them all the way back to the headquarters. So the cowboys found out the quickest and easiest way was to rope them, dismount, and treat the calf right on the spot. After doctoring that calf, he was soon able to return to the rest of the herd. Now these cowboys, they did that all day long. And after a while, well, hell, they got pretty good at throwing that rope. And that was the beginning of calf rope. Well now, progress was heading west. The corrals moved closer to the cattle. But the calves still needed doctoring. So naturally, the cowboys became better at their roping skills. Now, after a long, hard, cold winter, cowboys from different ranch outfits would get together. They'd spend some time exchanging stories about the happenings of the past few months tending the cattle. Now, cowboys visiting about their horses or visiting about their roping are bound to get into an argument about who has the best horse or who could lay down the best loop? Well, as you could guess, the next thing you hear is, well, I bet you this, or I bet you that, or let's put the money up. So by God, they did. And well, this led to the competition we know today as rodeo. Well, in the beginning, these cowboys hadn't yet developed any calf roping technique. Well, after all, it was the beginning. But just like the cowboys of today, these fellas, they gave it their best. Almost, partner. Now, if you notice, the cowboys would get off the left, run down the rope, and pick up the calf by the front leg and push him over. This was called legging the calf. <laughs> well, as you can see, calf roping wasn't judged on its style. It's a timed event. The cowboy who could throw the rope, tie down his calf the quickest, well, he was considered the winner. Well, back then, it didn't have to be pretty. Any catch would do, just as long as he snagged the calf. Well, after some wild chases, tough loops, and perseverance, the calf roping was soon on its way to greatness. Through the process of trial and error, the calf roper soon realized that legging was not the fastest way to take down a calf. So the cowboy developed a technique called flanking. The cowboy would run down the rope, 
grab the calf by the flank, put him down, tie him up, and then signal for time. Now flanking the calf on the right side was a major breakthrough for the cowboys. It enabled him to get down to the calf a lot quicker and make quicker times. Well, unfortunately, a breakthrough in one area soon led to a problem in another. The calf roper had to learn how to get off the horse from the right side. The development of such skill, technique, and coordination between a man and his horse can only be marveled at. But in the meantime, there was going to be a lot of frustration and sweat and years spent in the practice pen to learn how to train the calf horse and develop the proper techniques for riding, roping, dismounting, flanking, and tying up calves. But ultimately, the perseverance and hard work would pay off for the calf roper. Today, calf roping has developed from a ranch job of doctoring out in the pasture into a precise science of movement, timing, and reflexes, combining in what we know today as the art of calf roping. My name is Jimmy Cooper. I've been roping calves ever since I was a little kid. I love calf roping. I think it's the most complex, difficult event there is. Because I love the art of calf roping, I thought it would be neat to put together a tape with three of the top ropers of today, along with myself, that would get into a little bit of instruction and a lot of roping. For 10 years now, I've made my living rodeoing. In 1980, I was a calf roping rookie of the year, the steer wrestling and the all-around champion. In 1981, I was a world champion all-around cowboy. Because I feel so strongly about calf roping, I felt like it was a, almost an essential to make a tape that got a little deeper into the art of calf roping than just an instructional tape. We have some good instruction here. We touch the basics really good. So we have Roy Cooper. He's tall and he's slender, and his movements are like watching ballet. He's taken roping to a point beyond where it was when he came in. He's got a lot of credit for that. We have Troy Pruitt, who I compare with Roy because he's the same size, basically, the same type of roping, He's young, he's, he's on the scene new. He ropes so smooth and just like ballet, but the comparison is Troy grew up in a city. He never had the opportunity that Roy did. I've got Ricky Canton in. He's not very big, 
you wouldn't think that Ricky would be able to be competitive amongst the top cowboys in the world. But Ricky will fool you because Ricky's tough. His hands are so fast. What Ricky has done is he's found a new ingredient for himself that he didn't have. He didn't have the size like myself or, or the, the length and the tallness that Roy and Troy have, but he didn't let that stop him. He kept working at it, and through a lot of practice, he come up with a tie that is incredible. Myself, I'm not fast like Ricky, and I'm not as tall and as lengthy as Roy and Troy, so I have my limitations in that area. But I'm stronger than any of them, and that's my strong point. So I've figured out a way to kind of work my way through the, the dismounting and the wrapping them up because I'm not talented in that area like they are, but I can get them flanked a lot of times when they couldn't. Basically, the thing I'm getting at here is find your own personality and develop it. If you're a little bit smaller, let Ricky be an inspiration. If you're tall and slender and you can move like a cat, let that be your inspiration from Roy and Troy. If you're none of the above, but that you just hard-headed and you're just gonna gut it out until it's over and you have some strength to do it with, then let me be your inspiration. But in all this, I want you to understand calf roping, the art of calf roping, is fun to me, and I hope it will be for you also. Flanking and tying has been an asset for me, not because of my speed, but because of my consistency. If you'll just walk through this with me, I'll try to explain and go through the steps how to get one flanked and tied. Maybe not as fast as somebody like Ricky, but get him tied right and get him tied tight. As we dismount our horse and start down the rope, You'll be reaching and grabbing the rope like this as you go down it. I don't like to get in here too close to my rope like this and too square. And when I'm referring to square, I'm talking about being your shoulders being perpendicular to the rope. I would rather be a little bit away from the rope, and it's almost like I'm in my right lead going down the rope. My left hand will be just a little bit in front of me, and my right hand will be out in front of me. And my right hand is for two purposes. One, to make sure the calf's head is where it needs to be as I get there to flank him. The other reason is to keep my momentum going forward. Just a little more weight out in front of me keeps me going down the rope. Now, as I come down the rope, if you're running, you want to make sure that as you get there, your footsteps are really smooth. No jumping and, and leaping in here. Your left foot should hit right in front of the calf's left front foot. You run your left hand all the way down to the calf's head. You're reaching for the flank with your right hand. Your right foot goes under the calf about the middle of his belly. If you start getting it too far back, he'll hook that back leg on you and your knee can go into his flank instead of his ribs. All right, as you get him right here, you'd be crouching down as you come into this position and your knee, your chin should come right in here to the middle of his back. This kind of locks your back down where you can lift with your legs more than just your back and your arms. As you get in here, you're gonna pull him up out of the ground. What you're basically doing is pulling him up on this right leg. It's just like putting him on a loading ramp. You pull him up on that ramp, then you pick him up with your leg. As you pick him up, he'll pop when you pick your leg up. At that point when he pops, you release the rope by his head and grab the front leg. Now he should be at the top of his ascent here when you grab the front leg. Now you reach to get your pig and string and as he hits the ground, you keep your eyes focused on the front leg and string him and start stepping around into position. So if you get your feet into the right position 
and get your head down here like that. You reach and you flank him and get the front leg. Okay, here we got a shot of Ricky. He's coming down the rope and he places his left knee in front of the calf to block him off. Now he does this to keep the calf from getting by him. That's a real good insurance policy if you're a little bit lighter and smaller like Ricky. On the other hand, if you're taller and heavier like Troy, you don't have to take that time to block the calf off. You can go right straight into flanking position and get him flanked up good and high like Troy does here. And this will set you up and get ready for a good tie run. At this point, I'm watching the calf and concentrating, trying to read what he might be fixing to do. I get my shoulders and my body rotated and get into flanking position. It's important to get a good flank job so that you give yourself a chance to have a good tie. Now that we have the calf flanked, we're ready to string him and go on with the tie. When you place a pig and string on the leg, you want to make sure that your loop is about the size of your hand. If it's a little bigger or a little smaller, that's up to you. Just make sure that it's something that you feel comfortable with. As you take the pig and string out of your mouth, you want to be concentrating on the leg where you want the pig and string to go. I like to pull my pig and string back rather than out. It seems like it's less likely to come off. As I pull the pig and string back, I'll move around into position. Now, if your horse is pulling just right, that's a step you won't have to go through. But when I'm practicing my flanking and tying, it's one I always try to practice. Next, I lay my pig and string out real deliberate. As I do this, it pulls my body out and around the calf. I want to make sure I don't step too close to the calf's legs. I want to keep my, right, my left leg and my thigh over here on the calf with some pressure. Okay, I'm over the legs and I reach to get the bottom leg. If the top leg happens to be backwards, it's no problem. You just roll it over first. Then you start bringing the legs up. As you bring the legs up, you'll slide your right leg right along with you. The ideal point to cross the legs is right in the middle. You don't want to cross them too far forward. So what you have to do is bring the front leg back at the same time. Now as you cross them, you notice I was real smooth and deliberate about getting those legs into position. That's really important because that'll help keep the calf still while you're trying to tie. Okay, at this point, I have pressure with my thighs right in here on his back legs. I have some pressure on my left leg, kind of mashing him down, and I'll have some pressure with my left leg. As I place the legs in there, I can pick my pig and string up with my fingers. This allows me to get my tie started real quick. If you like close wraps, you have that option. You can just take your wraps around here really close. If you like to get out on your string a little bit further, you can also do that. You just slide out a little earlier and make your wraps. Now, once you've got the calf wrapped and you've been concentrating on where the wraps go, you can put your hand in here to get your hooey. This loop right here is what I refer to as the bubble. Make sure that you don't get yourself on a little too small of a bubble. If you keep your bubble big enough where your hand can slide through there smoothly, you can get your hooey real well. As you get your hooey, I like to pull it tight with my right hand. Some people just like to just pull it with their left hand. That's up to you. That's a personal preference. When you get your hooey, then you signal for time. String names, one. Getting into position, two. Picking up the legs, three. Placing them, four. Wrapping, five. Hui, six. Seven, you're done. Everyone's gonna have their own particular style that works good for them. But basically, you're gonna be using the same techniques, the, fa the same fundamentals. You can see Troy here, he's got a lot of length in his body to deal with. This is gonna allow him to do things a little bit different. 
He picks up the pig and string basically the same as anyone's going to pick up the pig and string. He gets out on his pig and string a little bit longer away from the legs and kind of spins the string on there. As you go slow, you can see this pretty closely. If you put it in fast motion, you can't hardly even pick it up. Now, although Roy and Troy are built basically the same, they both have a lot of length to deal with. You can see the contrast even in their styles. Roy, as opposed to Troy, will get his pig and string really close to the legs when he picks it up. As he picks it up, he stays close to the legs and wraps in a style called short wrapping. He's pretty much made this style famous, and it's a trademark of his. Now you see Ricky, his arms and his legs aren't nearly as long as Roy and Troy's. Some people might think this would be a disadvantage where he wouldn't have that reach and that length to get around the calf. Ricky's learned to use it to an advantage because he doesn't have to get around the calf as far. He's able to take his short legs and his short arms and put them in a fast motion around that calf. You notice he didn't pick his pig and string up and stay short. He got out on it and really whipped it around there. As he does this, you can put this in fast motion and see that this guy can sure enough tie. No matter what style you have for flanking and tying, you must stick to the basics. Always when things get tough, you go back to the basics. After working hard, putting out a lot of effort and sweat, maybe even a lot of discouragement, you'll finally come up with a style that you too can call your own. The rope is one of the most important tools in the calf roping process, and I'm going to show you how it works. First you have your Honda, and this strand of rope slides through it. Then you have your shank, which you hold on to. Basically, you're holding on to it with your hand. The spoke comes through the eye of your rope and crosses over so it can lay in your hand like this. And that way, you're holding on to the part that's attached to the Honda and you're letting the other part slide through your hand. This is how you feed your rope. Okay, when I get ready to swing my rope, I start out with a little bit more rope between my hands than I would be roping with. This is called the spoke. As I swing my rope, I'll feed it. As I feed it, you notice the measurement between your hands comes from your right hand to either your shoulder or your chin. That's an approximate measurement. Now that we've kind of gotten through some of the basics of the rope, I'm going to go rope the dummy. Now as I go get ready to rope the dummy, I prepare my mind. I feel like that when you're practicing, you need to practice to do things right. I like to get my loop right, get my rope right. I even pretend that I'm on a horse, backed in a box with my rope under my arm, getting ready to nod. I feel like that if I'll concentrate on all these things while I'm practicing roping the dummy, they'll come to me easier when I'm in a real life situation. One of the last things I concentrate is where my target is. That particular target in calf roping is right behind the right ear of the calf. It's on his neck and it'll be about where the dummy ties in with the bale of hay. As you rope the dummy, I like to practice throwing my slack a few different ways. It enables me to get a different go on my calves sometimes. This is a real good illustration of where the first place your rope should hit on a calf. You notice how the figure eight comes around and comes right back to the Honda where it originally started. From this angle, you can see how the rope really stays open until it hits the calf. As it hits the calf, then it starts making its figure eight and comes around to form the curl. A nice smooth motion with the slack helps set up a good run. 
Here we have a close-up shot of how your figure eight would come around and be welcome down. You can see how it stays tight around his neck. This is going to prevent you from picking up a back leg or even a front leg. Here you can see it happening on a real calf. Now on a video, we've tried to put as much in as we can about roping, but it's hard for me to talk and cover everything about how you hold a rope, how you would swing a rope, the different position your hand or your arm might be, the different uh, circumstances that are going to come up, and different things that you might have to do to compensate for them or to keep from getting yourself in a trap. What I would suggest if you're real serious about your calf roping is go to a school, find somebody that can help you, and work real hard at it. Wanna go for a ride with me? What? I'm just leaning up here for a second. Come on, honey. Boy, you sure do look good. <laughs> You're so cute. <laughs> well, I'm coming up, Brucey. Here it comes. Where? Excuse me. All right, I'm coming up. Where? All right, don't move. Don't, don't move, Brucey. You're moving. Where? All right, here it goes. Ha! Ha-ha! A cowboy! Hey, I'm doing real good, huh, Brucey? Here it comes. All right, Corey, go. Corey, Corey. Hey, Jimmy, how you doing? Oh, man. Hey. What are you doing? I'm taking my horsey for a ride. Corey, I've told you time and again how to saddle a horse. Yeah, what? Well, look, you've got the skid boots on his front feet. They, they don't go on the front feet? They go on his back feet. you got the saddle on backwards. Whoa. Backwards? What do you mean backwards? And yeah, you got it turned around. You uh, got the bridle back here on his back end. The bridle doesn't go over there either. No, man. You got the skid boots and the splint yeah. boots and the bell boots all messed up. Hey, come on. What do you mean? What do you got on his head there? That's my old hat. You like it? Come on. I'll show you one more time how to saddle a horse. Okay? You'll show me again, Jim? One more time. Okie dokie, Jimmy. I'm coming with you. Oh. All right. I'm coming. Wait. Whoa. All right. Hang on. Hang on. Hey. Whoa. Ah! Whoa. Oh, ow, I'm caught up. All right, Jimmy, I'm coming. Whoa. Corey, the first thing you want to do when you're saddling your horse is get his back cleaned off. I usually brush my horse off, but dusting him off will be fine. Oh, the next thing we want to do is put our blankets on. Hey, I wear a blanket at night when I go to sleep to keep me warm. Well, these serve a little different purpose. These are saddle blankets, and they're made out of wool. And one thing they do is keep his back cool when we're roping. Another thing is you want to make sure you have the right amount of blankets and the right type of blankets so that when your saddle's sitting on it and he takes a jerk from the calf, it doesn't bump him in the withers. The next thing we'd like to do is put our saddle on. Just lay it up there nice and gentle. Make sure it fits snug. Now, as you do that, you can see right in here, you put your hand in there, and you can make sure that the saddle has plenty of clearance so it doesn't bump him. The first thing I like to do when I'm saddling him up is my front cinch. Now, I'll get my front cinch, thread my ladder go through there. One thing you, you kind of want to make careful you don't do is pull him up too tight. If you just lean back and put it to him pretty tight, he's liable to come untrained on you. The next thing is the back cinch. Again, you don't want to get it too tight right off the front. Your brass collar. Okay, now, at this point, we've got the saddle cinched up. We've got our back cinch is not too tight. The front cinch is not too tight. We've got our brass collar on, and we already have our equipment on his feet. The skid boots, Corey, they go on the back with the buckles on the outside. Oh, on the outside. Oh, okay. These skid boots serve to protect his feet whenever he stops so he doesn't burn his ankles or get any scratch marks on them. On his front, we have the splint boots. Again, the buckles and the hardware are facing out. And how come we, those are on there? Well, in case he wants to hit himself when he's running, he won't hurt. He'll hit the boots instead. We have our bell boots on for the same type of deal. If he was to stop and bump it, it'll absorb the shock with those bell boots instead of damaging his foot. They got bell bottoms. 
almost the same thing. Now we're ready to put our neck rope on. You use a neck rope to keep the horse from trying to get away if something was to scare him. He would be able to run around a little bit but not run plumb off and injure anything. Okay, now that we've got our neck rope and saddle and everything, we're ready to put our jerk line, jerk line on. This is a very important piece of equipment that I use every time I rope. We've got all of this ready. Now we're going to put the bridle and tie down on. I always put my tie down on first. Make sure when it's adjusted the head stall that it's right in here between his eyes and his nose. Next comes the bridle. If you'll put your thumb in there, he'll just open his mouth up real gently, and then you can put it on his ears. And you brush his teeth? Corey, this is a serious matter. We're trying to get all of our equipment just right here, because if anything was to malfunction, it can cause a real wreck. So it's really important. Now I'm ready to snap my tie down and my breast collar snap. I want to make sure that I keep the hardware away from the horse so it doesn't cause him to get sore. As I'm doing it, I also check to make sure the D-ring is in the center. If it gets over to either side, it can cause the horse to get a real bad sore. So you do a lot of these things just to keep the horse from getting hurt, huh? This horse is a real valuable commodity in my calf roping. Mm -hmm. And if something happens to him, then it's a hindrance to me. Plus. After I have him for a while, he gets to be a real good friend of mine. I don't like anything bad happening to him. That sounds good to me. And now, I'm ready to go rope. Oh, you're going roping? Yeah. All right, well, I'll see you later, Jimmy. All right. I'm going to Miami. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> good Rodeo was more like family. The only thing I can say bad about rodeo is we was all underpaid. <laughs> You can't practice enough. I mean, I'm going to say the, probably the year I had my very best years as far as financially, money-wise, was 82, 83. Uh, when I was rodeoing, I might go to 100 rodeos over 120. When I come home, my vacation was going to the practice tent. I mean, I come home, I roped every day. I mean, when I wasn't on the road, I practiced, and it, it shows and pays off. You have to practice. You. I mean, I can tell it today. I mean, I can see it in me. I can see it in youth. I can see it in older guys. I can see it in guys that how you can rope, what you can do. You have to practice. I started roping calves uh, because we used to go to what they called play days, and we uh, they used to rope calves there, and I just got pretty interested watching them. It seemed like an awful fun thing to be doing. Uh, practicing uh, in the proper form is one of the most important parts because at the rodeos you take shortcuts anyway. And, and in the practice pen, I think a person needs to be just a little bit more deliberate and slow down just a little bit. You don't have to go, you know, gut out every run. But, uh, you know, it's good every once in a while, but practicing the right form and the right techniques makes things a lot easier when you get to the rodeos. Jimmy Cooper has influenced my roping quite a bit, especially through the early years when, when I was really green. He kind of took me in, and for the first couple months that I hauled real hard, I hauled with Jimmy, and uh, he taught me an awful lot, and if I ever have a problem, I always call him as to whether, you know, how. If I'm doing something wrong, Jimmy seems to be able to know me well enough and know my style of roping that he helps me out. I've never, never really let a, uh, my size be a factor in my roping. I've started when I was 10 or 11, you know, and just started on big calves, kind of, and just figured the ways out how to get them down and things like that. Well, they say I got the fastest hands. I don't know. It just comes natural. I just do what it feels. You know how it feels. I think practicing, you know, when you're, when you're on the road a lot, you don't get to practice much, but practicing is probably one of your most important things about roping and rodeoing.
This is the roping box. There's a major part of the whole run begins and it's real complex in this area. First of all, there'll be a barrier at the rodeo stretched across the front of the box. There's one rope stretched across there. There's another rope on the calf's neck. What they do is the one on the calf's neck, when he gets a certain distance out there, it'll release the one in front of you and it gives you a signal that you can be on your way. What we try to do is time our horse so that he gets there just as it releases. That's be what we refer to as a really good start. When I get in the box and I start trying to get all my equipment ready, making my final preparations, I want to make sure that my second string is tucked in properly. For myself, I like to carry it on the left side. I don't really care how anyone else puts it in or carries it, just as long as I think it's an important part to have a second string. If you carry your jerk line on the right side, you normally have your pig and string on your left side. Your jerk line is most of the time a little cotton rope. It's tied onto the bridle on one side or the other. That depends on the horse. You just have to make sure that you know your horse and you can find out what he works best. Sometimes they work best with it on the left, sometimes on the right, sometimes with a lot of deep tucks, sometimes not. Now what a tuck is, is when you stick it in your belt. This would be a tuck. On this particular horse, I like to use three tucks that aren't biting him too hard. And when I say aren't biting him too hard, that means that as they pull out of my belt, they're not gonna jerk on him too hard. If I had it tucked real deep like this, as it pulled out, it would jerk him really hard. And for this horse, it would make him scramble too much and it would make it hard for me to make a run. So we've got our second string in properly. We've got our jerk line in properly. Got our first pig and string here ready to go. Make sure our rope's all right. Got a neck rope and I like to use a hobble strap. Just gives me a little more insurance. When I back my horse into the box, I want to make sure that he's standing level, ready to break fast. As I look at the calf, I also want the calf to be looking towards the front, standing level and on the mark to go. At this point, we thought it would be nice to slow some of the runs down, give you an opportunity to see in more detail just exactly the technical aspects that we'll be talking about. Now this calf came out and went to the right a little bit. It made it hard to hold my slack, so I tried just laying it over to the left. The calf got more jerked than I really wanted and was kind of dead getting up. When, when he's kind of squatting like that, I just tried to make sure I really pulled him up out of that ground good and high then just a good solid tie. Now this calf ran to the left a little bit and it was easier to hold my slack. Uh, this type of a calf is really easy for me to make a run at the rodeo on because it's easier to rope them when they're going to the left and it's easier to get that nice handle. Again, you just want to try to finish with a good solid tie. Okay, this calf didn't really leave the chute very good. It's important to pay attention to how much the calf leaves, not just the timing between when you nod and when you go. He ran straight, it's a really nice pattern. As I step off, I try to lay my slack just right where I don't get a real hard jerk. This particular jerk is a pretty favorite one of mine. And right here, my horse should have been getting back a little more and helping keep the calf straight and get him up. Uh, I was able to get around his head and get into position so I could get him flanked. But it did cause me to have to flank him a little bit high just to be sure. Flanking him a little bit high right here is one way that you can maintain the consistency. If I'd have tried to flank him just real low and snap him, there's a good chance I would have messed up on my flanking.
This is a good shot of the plane that your rope should be in and the position of your horse right before you throw. As the rope gets there, you can see how the curl comes around and where the rope actually hits. It's a good shot of all these things. Rodeo time. You got a good calf drive? Let's see if you can get the money. Just a nice little old lollipop. This runs out out there a good pattern. Doesn't do anything. Just hangs on the end of it and lays like he's shot. Do not make a mistake on this kind of calf. As you set this run up, you can see how to complete your follow through. Really reach to the end of that rope before you start pulling your slack. Here you can see how to really get tagged up. You can see the horse really starting in the ground. I'm sitting there in position, kind of helping him get in there. This is so important when you have a big calf that might be running hard. Now I got a little more jerk than a guy would really want, but if you had this kind of a good calf and you did get that jerk, you can't really do a lot to get him up. You kind of have to be in position and be ready for whenever he gets up himself. Pay real close attention to stringing that front leg. There's been a lot of runs that guys mess up because they try to string that front leg too fast. If you'll just be deliberate about stringing it and then go on with a good solid tie, you don't run into problems very often. Now this calf runs a little harder. He's a pretty good sized black calf, so what I like to do is just lay my slack over to that left. It gives me a nice jerk, but it's not too hard of a jerk. It gives me a chance to get there just as he gets up off the ground. Then, once again, a good solid tie is what you're looking for. Okay, this calf eases off to the right a little bit. It's not too bad. It's a good calf. He's not running too hard, so it's a good calf to just hold your slack and try to spin him around. As I start to flank him, you can see that he tried to really jerk and twist around. Those are the hard kind of flank. By getting him flanked, you're able to go ahead and make a good run. Here you've got a good calf. It's important to rope these calves quick. When you're practicing, you're going to have an opportunity to make some runs just like you'd make the rodeo sometimes. Say on this run, it was a short score and they're going to be tying them fast. You better go ahead and try to get you a good run made on this type of calf. Uh-oh. Sorry, Loop. Threw it looking more at the top of his head than I was at his neck. I was lucky it went on there. Uh, I've seen a lot of guys win a lot of money by just going ahead and being prepared to finish off when you do have some good luck. This is a picture of the way that my loop should look on a calf if I'm concentrating on the right spot. That Honda should hit right up against his neck. We're going to go with that same calf, but we're going to complete the run this time. It's a good calf, uh, concentrating on that one point a little bit more. Now this calf slows down just as he gets to the end of the rope. If you're not careful and run your left hand all the way in there to the calf's head, it'll get hard to flank. Now this doggone black calf right here got the best of me twice. First, as he come out and started to the left, he deceived me because just as I rope him and place my slack, setting him up for a nice run, he changes his direction and goes back to the right. Well, this sets himself up for a hard jerk. This calf was a little bit weak and tired, and I didn't really want to jerk him that hard. Now I've got to try to get this lazy sucker up. I'm digging. I'm trying as hard as I can. My horse isn't backing up quite as much as I'd like for him to. I'm rolling him up, trying to get him on his feet. Right there, he barely gets on his feet. It's, it's legal, but it's still going to be hard for me to get him down and get a good tie. But the thing is, you don't ever quit. You just keep gutting it out until you can finally get him down and then go ahead and try to finish off with a nice smooth tie. I think you can learn a lot by watching calf roping in slow motion. The different techniques, the different positions. 
You can even watch it and pick out some things that I didn't get a chance to illustrate. Now Roy and Troy and Ricky and myself fixing to go to the practice pen. We're going to get down and do some practicing. As we go through the practice, I want you to notice that whatever happens, we try to just keep right on going until it's finished. Remember, consistency is so important.
I hope you've enjoyed what you've just seen, and I appreciate you taking the time out to watch it. I love calf roping, and I hope the art of calf roping lives on forever. But most of all, just remember, keep your roping fun. Thank you. My name is Dale Carroll. I'm formerly of Texas. I now live in Chowchilla, California, and I train calf roping horses for a living. I've been training calf roping horses successfully for about 30, 35 years, and a calf roping horse can either make you or break you in the calf roping run. He's about 75%, and a good calf roping horse is vital to winning money on the rodeo trail. And so I hope through this video that I can help you understand your horse and get along with him better throughout your roping career. 